told me that it was only fitting and it was so because he said that it was the wheelbarrow that taught our people to walk upright. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, may I invite your attention to that preceding page, just as you just turned? May I, sir, the last sheet that you just turned? Yes. Those are church bulletins yesterday on your birthday. We refer to that as Super Sunday for all Americans and people in all the churches, uh, many of the churches and synagogues are signing these uh, sheets wishing you a happy birthday. So those are yesterday's church bulletins in northeast Louisiana. And this is, uh, this is 30,000 before yesterday. And uh, from everybody oh. except the churches, and the churches will be coming down. Excuse me, Ralph, let me point out, sir, there, Mr. President, those are pictures of places where those window stickers were put for people where they could go in and sign and say thank you and happy birthday, President Reagan. But those were all over the city. The TV was carrying it. The cable news network carried it. So all of them, we don't, we don't understand these polls, sir. The uh, performers, uh, <laughs> we don't know anything about the 50,000 people who don't understand polls. So we just express our love to you in a very meaningful way and not knowing understand the polls. We appreciate your effort. I you, I am believe me, deeply moved. And I'm gonna look, I'm gonna look through this. Excuse me, but, and they have beautiful, beautiful letters to you. Of course, they all want a picture of you and a letter from you and all that sort of thing. <laughs> They'll get it if there's any addresses in there. And incidentally, uh, is your daughter's address in, in there? I sure will get it to you, sir. Please do, because I'd better <laughs> communicate. Thank you, sir. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be looking through this at, at greater length, believe me. So new orders will translate immediately into new production and employment and so forth, uh, quite strongly given the slack of uh, labor market. <coughs> David Newell from Channel 4. Good to see you. And I'm Raymond Matthews from Channel 7. Yes. Good to see you. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Hello there. Hello, Mr. Yes. as you are. I'm glad, however, that when I'm watching you, you couldn't stand to watch me because you're usually in, in the dressing room upstairs changing clothes, either to go to the exercise room or coming from it. But uh, I'm happy to have you here at the White House. And I do watch, as I say, your newscasts, and I'm well aware that across the country, more people depend on local news than they do on the national news get the news from the local news broadcasts. Now, I know you've been briefed or were being briefed by Dave Stockman and Buck Chabotin, and you'll be hearing from Bud McFarlane and Cap Weinberger a bit later. But just let me say that since economic recovery has been the lead story on most programs lately, it's awfully good to see. We've been seeing more signs that the economy is on the mend. And if I could just mention a couple of them. You know, of course, that inflation rate for 82 is down to 3.9. But not too much attention has been paid to the fact that for the last three months of 1982, it was down to an annualized rate of 1.1. If that could continue for 12 months uh, instead of three. The index of leading indicators up eight of the last nine months. Real wages have gone up in the last three months. They've been going down for the last four years. Housing starts are up. Housing permits are up and sales of new homes has grown by 75% since last April. The auto industry is picking up. We all know General Motors has announced they're going to call back more than 21,000 people in the next few months. Initial claims for unemployment insurance down, and of course, I think we must have all been pleased to see at least the slight turnaround there, the four and tenths of percentage point turnaround on the average. and. Uh, more than that, if you take the new method of counting, which I always thought should be the only method, I don't know how we've been able to 
ignore almost two million people that are fully employed in the military, and yet at the same time, I don't know whether you're aware that every time one of them left the military, didn't get a job, he was counted as unemployed. But he or she were not counted as employed when they had those jobs. I think it's a, a more sensible way of counting. We try to be cautious with our projections, but I think it's interesting that the Congressional Budget Office, which is usually more pessimistic than ourselves, is now sounding more optimistic that we can have a better recovery. Uh, Alice Rivlin has just become so attractive to me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we intend to work with the Congress, as I'm sure you've been told, to see that this stays on track. And now I know we only have a few minutes. But <clears throat> Mr. President, what do you uh, think about all of these stories that you're really not in uh, control of the, <clears throat> the budget data and you flunked David Stockman's multiple choice questionnaire? And I've got a doll in my desk I stick pins into <laughs> when I read them. It, uh, I don't know what that, well, I suppose I shouldn't have been too surprised. I think it happens to uh, more than one person. I recall attempts of that kind when I was in uh, uh, Sacramento as governor. Then they called it the Palace Guard. But um, uh, no, and I think anyone that's in our administration will tell you that uh, that has anything to do with policy making, that um, I make the decisions. Maybe part of it has come about because of the change that we've made in the cabinet system. As nearly as I've been able to find out, previous administrations back through the years have sort of used the cabinet as maybe they'd come once a month and, uh, and the, go around the table with each cabinet head and give him a little brief verbal report of what his agency was doing. Well, I started something in California with the cabinet that I brought here. And that was that it's a kind of a board of directors operation. We sit around the cabinet table as we're sitting here. And in, instead of just uh, the one person, if he thinks that, well, it's his agency problem, and he's the only one who can speak on that, no. Everybody has a, a pitch in. And we sit there and we discuss and sometimes argue. And it goes around the table and around. And when I finally heard enough uh, to finalize my own decision, I make the decision. And that ends the discussion on that. If I haven't, if it's something that's so tough that there's so much right on both sides, um, send them away to come back the next day. And we'll take it up again. And maybe that has led uh, to this. I've noticed that it's always uh, from those unidentified uh, White House uh, informants uh, that this talk, this conversation comes. But uh, I would turn my back and uh, but I think the cabinet members answer, and I think you find the answer was I made the decision. Mr. President, Mr. President, are you at all concerned about an apparent continuing perception among a number of black leaders that the White House continues to be, um, if not hostile, at least not welcome to black viewpoints, and that administration policies are working to widen the income gap between blacks and whites and also increase black unemployment? I'm aware of all of that, and it's very disturbing to me, because anyone who knows my life story knows that long before there was even a thing called the Civil Rights Movement, I was busy on that side uh, as a sports announcer. I didn't have any Willie Mays or Reggie Jacksons to talk about when I was broadcasting Major League Baseball the opening line of the Spalding Baseball Guide said baseball is a game for Caucasian gentlemen. And as a sports announcer, I was one of a very small fraternity that used that job to editorialize against that ridiculous blocking of so many fine athletes and so many fine Americans from participating in what was called the Great American Game. I was raised that way. God bless them. My father and mother both long gone now. But uh, I can remember when I was only that high and one of the all-time great motion picture classics, Birth of a Nation, came to our town. In our household, my father simply announced that no member of our family would see that picture because it was based on the Ku Klux Klan. 
And to this day, I have never seen the great motion picture classic. So it, yes, it's very frustrating. But none of it, and I wonder sometimes if some of those leaders aren't, maybe they don't even realize it, but aren't more interested in maintaining a kind of difference and a spite, uh, because that's uh, their position uh, in, and their line of work. But the truth is, none of it is true in this administration. I can cite you the figures on what we have done with regard to civil rights violations. Uh, I can cite you what we have done for the, uh, for the Negro colleges and the, their funds raising uh, effort. Uh, as for what we've done with regard to unemployment or trying to make a difference, I know this thing about supposedly the our tax program is for the rich. I've never been able to figure that out. We have a progressive tax system. You move as you get more income into higher brackets. In the recent years, with inflation, you've moved uh, whether you've got a higher income, but just if you've got a pay raise that simply that you supposedly break even, you didn't break even because the government put you up in a higher percentage bracket. But when we gave our tax cut, 25% across the board, Yes, if you want to use the number of dollars, a fellow that's paying $100 income tax uh, is not going to get as many dollars in relief as the fellow that's paying 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000, but proportionately, they are. And if we, had, if we had staggered our tax cut, instead of level across the board, we would have, in, in effect, legislated an increase in the pro progressivity, which, as we know, goes from a quite lower percent on up now to 50, but it once upon a time went to, uh, well, when I was getting some of that if money in Hollywood, it was 94%. And it uh, used to curtail your picture-making efforts because there came a point every year when somebody submitted a script and you said, not me, I'm not gonna work for six cents on the dollar. But, uh, I think that anyone would find, and with regard to unemployment, there's no question that this has been, and it's one of the things that I think for years we've been trying to correct, that when unemployment comes, and there have been seven spells of this since World War II before this one, and always the same thing was true, that it seemed that uh, black employees uh, suffered more and a higher rate of unemployment. I have tried uh, to convince many black leaders and labor leaders that with regard to the minimum tax for youngsters, for teenagers, for kids that want summer jobs, we should have a two-stage tax because before there was a minimum wage, I said minimum tax, did I, minimum wage, before there was a minimum wage, young teenage blacks had a far lower rate of unemployment than teenage whites. And as the minimum wage was put into effect and began to increase, this reversed. And I think that it's, it's of course, affected all teenagers. <clears throat> but I think that for youngsters beginning to go into the workforce, they're not gonna take any adult's job away from them. They never did. They're learning a job, they're getting a skill, they're performing tasks that at a proper price, an employer will hire them. But if you make the price too high, there are tasks that the employer feels he can do without. And so no one is hired to take those jobs. Mr. President, uh, you just celebrated your birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. And I just the, week be more. The, week, the week before <laughs> that, the week before that, uh, the foot race began toward New Hampshire and Illinois, uh, the caucus in uh, Illinois, the New Hampshire primary. What are you going to announce? <laughs> your intentions about running the game? Well, I think, and if you look back over history, uh, that is a ticklish uh, thing for a president, his first term. He makes an early decision one way, he becomes a lame duck. If he makes it the other way, he's then accused of everything he does his political campaign. Um, so I think that uh, you wait, and I have not made a decision in that way, because I also believe that the people uh, let you know 
what the decision should be. Do you think you would agree? Does all this stuff do Well, I think this. Oh, well, on the, the other side. Oh, on the other side. Uh, I can understand that. Uh, um, I look at it uh, four years ago when it was, uh, or no, 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 six years ago when it was uh, uh, the Republicans' turn for uh, scrambling for a against a Democratic incumbent, and it was just much the same picture. We had a dozen or so out there. You were out there for two years, I think. What? Two, you were out there for two and a half years before uh, the uh, first primary election. No. As a matter of fact, uh, I refused to make a decision on that for quite some time. And uh, maybe you're, you're confused. There was a group that started in the country, and believe it or not, right, I right. didn't have anything to do with it. Okay. There was a move that, that started. Would you be reelected if the election were held today, Mr. President, <coughs> your view? Well, this would be the headline of my answer. I have to say this. I'm confused by some of the polls. Uh, I know a little about polls anymore, and I know a lot of it depends on how the question is asked. Um, but I get around the country enough, make enough appearances, that somehow I, I don't seem to run into many of those people. As a matter of fact, we have a kind of a standing thing in our family. Nancy's very critical of me because when you go out and the streets are lined with people and you know, away from Washington and so forth, and I know that much of that's simply because of the institution itself, the presidency, but um, the reaction of those people, but Nancy's annoyance is she says that I always somehow manage to see the one person in the whole crowd <laughs> who is doing like this, <laughs> or making a vulgar sign or something at me. And it is true, I do. Are you watching the, uh, we've reduced it, but now it is unemployment in the economy, and I could, I could expect that. And I'm very concerned about unemployment myself, and tragically it's usually the last thing that comes back uh, when you come out of a, of a, out of a recession. But um, yes, I would think that that would be, uh, if there is no recovery, obviously that'd be a sign. Mr. President, in our area, we're particularly concerned with the large number of federal employees. Of course, there are local viewers. And how does the administration justify or explain to them the freeze and the cutbacks and the reduction in the long term in the pension plans, which are so much better than, than private plans are generally? Well, for one thing, the, we have not affected the people that are presently employees, except there has been a change, um, that there's had to be an increase. Their pension plan is such that today, many retirees are getting more money than the, in retirement than the person is getting in wages who was doing the job they retired from. And so it was out of balance, and it was only fairness to ask with the with the built-in increases in those pensions, that they contribute a, a little larger share. Now, we've also added, we are covering them, the, them now for Medicare. They do not have such coverage. And with all the talk about whether Medicare is being increased in cost or not, or participation, which it is in our proposed budget, no one has added that we are adding to that, for the first time, catastrophic care that these people will now be protected against that catastrophic illness or injury that now and then totally devastates a family because there's no way that any individual could meet the cost. With regard to whether it's fair or not to ask them to take a freeze, first of all, a freeze in COLAs is not as significant as it was back when, uh, under the previous administration, the inflation rate was 12.4% or even 14% at one point. Um, it isn't that big a, a sacrifice, but in the condition that we're in, and in an effort to help this economy, we're asking that of everyone. And uh, I was impressed, I don't know which one of your stations it was, but I was impressed enough to make a phone call to that young enlisted man over at Fort Myers that someone interviewed as to how he felt about having the military pay froze. If anyone has a right to complain, they do, because up till recently, they were far behind anyone uh, with regard to pay that was commensurate with the work they were doing at all. 
Tip O'Neill and I have discussed this, that it isn't make work. If you simply stimulate um, or move up or accelerate a program of necessary public works. Now this is what we did with the gasoline tax. Everyone I know said, well I said I would not, you know, take a palace coup before I would ever accept such a gasoline tax. The framework in which I said that at a press conference was when it was being proposed as just a tax for general revenues to increase taxes, tax gasoline more. But more than a year before, uh, Drew Lewis had come to me with the rundown on our highway system and the bridges and even the real great risk and danger. Well, just the other day we saw a bridge collapse with several deaths. And a year before, when he had come with that, proposed a user's fee, a gas tax to simply finance that kind of construction. I had to ask him at that time, could he wait a year? And he did. When he came back, this <coughs> latter time, the report was even more dangerous, more threatening. The numbers of school buses in the country, that in their zones where there are bridges, come to the bridge and stop, and the students have to get out and walk across, and then the driver stays in and drives the empty bus across and picks them up again, because they're afraid that of an accident with all of those children in the school bus. So this time, having told him to wait a year, I said, yes, we'll go for it. Now this is legitimate. This is work that has to be done. The jobs are already going not to individuals that are suddenly given a job, whether they fit it or not. Uh, these are people, construction workers and construction companies, uh, delegation from the uh, uh, road building industry in, in, in Illinois presented me with a hard hat when I was out there because of the jobs. Uh, in Missouri, uh, they're all, they've already started uh, on their, their program of, of uh, rebuilding and even building new ones. Now, we have asked, and it won't change the budget a bit, that every agency and department that has got building, maintenance work that is in need of doing and has not been done and so forth, to accelerate it. It's in the budget already. Uh, don't schedule it for a year from now or six months from now. If you can't move it up and do it now, that will be legitimate work. The, uh, the make work jobs, I can give you one example of one that I vetoed when I was governor came from Washington and a governor could veto and if it wasn't overridden in 60 days with the federal government why it stayed permanent. This was a program to put 17 able-bodied welfare recipients to work in a county park, uh, cleaning up the park and keeping it cleaned up and everything. Why would I veto such a thing as that? Well, because more than 50% of the budget was going to go to 11 administrators to make sure that the 17 got to work on time. And I thought the percentages were a little long. Thank you, Mr. President. You have another meeting. I know. I Could you just tell us how you celebrated your birthday last night? What's that? How you celebrated your birthday last night? Well, yesterday we had to come down early from Camp David uh, <laughs> so we wouldn't get snowed in. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we just had a few people for a dinner that we'd been planning for some time. And, uh, and, and that's when the birthday was. Um, I had just received a very heartwarming uh, set of unusual gifts in the other room from some people from Monroe, Louisiana. And among them, though, was a framed picture. I'll take this as the celebration. A framed picture of the billboards that they put up all over Monroe. Regular billboards saying happy birthday to me and thanking me for coming down in the flood. And uh, another one was a facsimile of a check that the Goodfellows of Monroe contributed for flood relief. 83,600 some dollars. Their normal annual contribution is around $370. And uh, so that was enough of a celebration. You really don't celebrate when you get to this age, you just say thanks. That's <laughs> <laughs> president, his daughter sent you. He's a doodler too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you tell Brooke, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Are you still Thank rolling you. on your wheel? Every day. No, I gave that up. I've got a, there's a gym up there and I'm doing different sets of exercises. No, I tell you, I gave it up because I've been doing it about 15 years. 
and I began, my belt seemed to be as tight as ever. I was hard, and finally a man knowledgeable in that field told me that that was, yes it was, but it was also stretching the muscles. And since those muscles, uh, there was no place else for him to go but to bulge, so I quit, and I've got another set of exercises. What's your favorite exercise? What's your favorite exercise? Well, it's a, it's a whole variety of named the different muscles. And, uh, and uh, this same gentleman gave me a schedule of two for all in days. There's a little Nautilus machine up there with the weights and the pulleys and so forth. And I didn't think at my age you could grow muscle, but uh, I'm happy to have some coats let out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not down here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for coming back. All right. Thank you all. <clears throat> And what we're saying is that we probably won't get much more discretionary. We've cut the thumbnail. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to you again. <laughs> Second day in a row. impact an editorial has, not only on the folks at home, but on some people up on the hill. Uh, an editorial in the hometown paper can very often mean much more than any call from a lobbyist or even a call from the White House. There's a news story I'd like to emphasize today that you've been hearing about, and, and that is that all the signs are that we're now seeing point toward an economic recovery, or have you two covered that very well? Uh, you wouldn't... Go ahead. I wouldn't be going counter to you if I, no. I said that... As long as you say uh, recovery is here. What? As long as you say the recovery is here. Well, that's what I want to make sure you agree on, because that's what <laughs> I'm going to say. <laughs> yes, sir. The, uh, a lot of attention has been paid to the 1982 inflation rate, but I think even more significant, and everyone seems to have overlooked, is that while it was 3.9% for the year, for the last three months of 1982, it was running at one point on an annualized basis at 1.1%. And uh, I think the fact that it had come down to that and left that other lower average uh, is something that we can focus on as offering a little hope here. We know, of course, that unemployment rate went down last Friday. Uh, I'm hopeful that one of these days, is, now that they've changed the method, that they will stick with the change method instead of giving us two sets of figures. And it was only a few months ago that I found out that they were not including the military uh, in the unemployment figures. Well, there's almost two million uh, Americans that are fully employed. But what really triggered my reaction was when I found out that when one of them left the service and didn't have a job, he was considered unemployed. But he wasn't employed or considered employed when he had ones. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you noticed that the, the set of figures, this was the first time January using them, the set of figures, if you include the military, uh, went from a 10.7 rate then of unemployment to 10.2. The old-fashioned way, it's uh, still 10.4, down from 10.8. But um, there are other figures. One of the most significant was that actual employment rose by 350,000 in January, which means that businesses are hiring and rehiring workers. We've all seen the announcement of General Motors that's going to take back more than 21,000 over the next few months. Of Those were indefinite layoffs. The average work week 
went up an hour in January, which brought it almost to the full 40-hour figure. Housing is coming back. Housing starts are up. Permits are up. New home sales are up 75% uh, uh, since April of last year. Also, uh, supporting the recovery idea is the fact that there's a, nearly a 12% increase in new orders for durable goods. And of course, the, as you've probably been told, the leading indicators uh, have been up eight out of the last nine months. Now, if some of you are suspicious that my emphasizing all of this on top of what you've been hearing is in the hopes that you might take this as the message to take back home, your suspicions are absolutely correct. That's what I had in mind. I'm optimistic. I'm going to do all that I can, all of us here in the administration are, to work with the Congress to make sure this recovery stays on track. But now, uh, that's enough monologue. Uh, I know you've been conducting a dialogue so far, and you can continue with that. Someone has a question. Mr. President, I come from Baltimore, which is a city that uh, in the past week has lost 2,300 jobs at Western Electric and about 950 jobs at the Sparrows Point plant at Bethlehem Steel. One of our big concerns is, is what happens to a steel worker who's been on this job for 25 years and suddenly his job is gone. Uh, how do you feel about retraining? How can this country retrain its workforce? Uh, and in what directions? Well, we know that there has to be uh, retraining because, as you've probably been told already, part of this unemployment problem is structural. Uh, for example, over a two-year period, uh, when we first came in here, there were three million new people into the workforce uh, for the first time. And uh, the new jobs, because of the recession, were not being created to put those people to work. There will be uh, changes. I don't know whether, and maybe it has gotten to the point of someone with that much seniority uh, laid off. I was in an automobile plant the other day, you know, out in St. Louis, and in that plant, the uh, uh, person, those people still employed, the one with the least, senior, least sen seniority uh, were 16 years there because the layoffs come uh, designated by uh, seniority or lack of it. But the one job training plan that we've gotten past that we introduced and has already been legislated into law is designed, we think, better than many of the previous programs. First of all, where some of those job training plans, only uh, about 18 cents out of every dollar went to actual training. This one, better than 70 cents out of every dollar will go to training. But we're going to direct that training in cooperation with local officials and business and industrial leaders in the communities to train people for those jobs that are uh, vacant there in, in that area. And you all know from your own papers that on any representative Sunday, you have quite a package of help wanted ads. Now, I mentioned that once in a press conference and immediately got challenged that I was indicating that people were lazy and wouldn't go to work. I wasn't doing anything of the kind. Uh, we didn't have our this job training program in place at the time. And what I was pointing out, or trying to, was that if you read those ads, and I've done so. Many of the papers, uh, the last time was in Los Angeles. They were 45 and a half pages in the Sunday LA Times. Um, but you saw that they called for skills. And here to me was the greatest indication of the structural unemployment, that with 12 million unemployed in the country, uh, we could have that many pages of help wanted ads uh, in an area which was above, which was uh, around the national average or above, it indicated that there were job openings and there must be a lack of people with the training to fill them. So we're, we're doing more of this. And in the present budget, uh, we have made proposals about uh, using unemployment funds uh, in cooperation with the states that have their own unemployment funds for training, for relocation, and so forth. I think it can be done, but that's the direction we must go instead of giving someone an imitation job and, uh, temporarily. Mr. President, 
been some reports in the news recently that you may be leaning toward recommending or endorsing some kind of jobs program. Could you tell us exactly how you feel about this? You know, the thing that we have talked about and that is again provided for already in the budget is that where there are legitimate, and we got this idea from our uh, the gas tax program, and incidentally, with all this talk that I uh, had once said that I would take a palace coup to make me accept the five cent gas tax, that was when they were talking about it uh, as just general revenue, a tax increase. But Drew Lewis, uh, a Secretary of Transportation, had come to us over a year ago with a complete report on the state of our highways and bridges in the country and the desperate need and the almost emergency situation then. At that time, I asked him if he could hang on for a year and come back a year later, which he did. And so that really was a user's fee. It was the gas tax was packed, passed to get this necessary work that needs to be done, uh, get it in work. Now what we have uh, said to all of our agencies and departments is that the budgets for all of them, there's maintenance work, uh, construction, things of that kind that are called for and what we've said, expedited, uh, accelerated. Uh, don't wait if you've got it on schedule someplace down the line. It's already in the budget. It won't add anything to the deficit to, to do it. Go to work on it and start doing it to help in the recovery. Mr. President, are you prepared to accept uh, compromise reductions in the $239 billion defense budget? No. I think the only political mistake that we've made there with the defense budget is that in the old-fashioned way that has persisted so long in government where you pad the budget a little bit and then go up on the hill and let the Congress cut it, uh, where you already knew it could be cut, we didn't do that. Uh, under Secretary Weinberger, we've been trying to find uh, the cuts ourselves and where we can um, promote savings. And so a considerable amount of money was actually found by us when inflation went down faster than we thought, uh, fuel costs and everything going down, uh, management changes that were put into effect. And from the original five-year proposal of 1981, we came in with, and we'd reduced that about $41 billion ourselves. Then Congress added another chunk to that in the 83 budget. And uh, in this one, when our people up on the Hill said, if there's any way, anything we can find. And uh, I must say, CAP was cooperative. There were some things we hated, but I insisted that we stay with whatever we found, must not delay or <coughs> reduce our effectiveness, our ability to redress the, the military situation that had been allowed to deteriorate so badly. And we came up with $11.3 billion. Now, maybe we should have been smart and left the 11.3 in and let the Congress find it. But the minute we went there, up there with that cut in place, then they seem to think that, well, that must mean there's room for more. Uh, I think if there was, we would have found it. And I, Two more questions for the Mr. President. President, what would happen if your MX commission comes up with a recommendation uh, contradictory to uh, Secretary Weinberger's uh, recommendation? Well, we'll, that's the purpose of the commission. We'll study that, find out what it is they recommend. And uh, I realize that I'm the one that finally has to decide what we'll take up to the Hill as a recommendation to Congress. But I'm hopeful that the the Commission can come up with something that will be acceptable, but at the same time will meet the need for correcting this imbalance that exists. I must say to, to all of you that hear the drumbeat that has gone on consistently about the defense spending and all, all during the campaign, this question was thrown at me by audiences every place. Uh, I was amazed how many. The American people were aware that something wrong had taken place with regard to our military. I would get the question, well, if in trying to balance the budget, it comes down to a choice of rebuilding the defenses or balancing the budget, which would you do? And every single time I said I would come down on the side of national defense. 
And I never made that remark to an audience that I did not get, in many cases, a standing ovation, but at any rate, an ovation. And I think this steady drumbeat and this criticism from up in the hill has uh, created a, a false belief among too many people in this country that maybe uh, in one or two years we've, we've solved the problem. But we've got a long way to go before we really can say that we're able to meet the first prime responsibility of the national government, which is to be able to guarantee the safety and security of this nation and our people. And uh, the, the truth of the matter is, uh, everyone seems to overlook that as a percentage of gross national product, the defense spending is a smaller share of that than it has been at almost any time in the past except for the preceding few years when it was allowed to deteriorate so badly. And uh, even the outgoing administration had recognized that because they had submitted a plan for a five-year buildup of the military and uh, we now are adding only about three billion dollars a year to what their plan was. And frankly, part of that is because they could not have bought for the money figure they put in all the things that they had put in as required weapon systems and improvements. Mr. President, we have to ask you about the big news of the day, which is the Israeli Commission's report on Sabra and Shatila. There's a recommendation of General Sharon resign, and there may be some change in the Israeli government. I imagine you've studied it by now. Do you have any comment? Well, this is a very easy one. I, that's a strong democracy over there, and that's an internal problem, and uh, I just don't think that we should be commenting or injecting ourselves into that internal problem. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. I have to go now? <laughs> we didn't get all the way around. <laughs> well, thank I'm you. sorry. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this very much. And thank you all for coming here. We'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President.